Thanks for joining us today. This is a very important topic, although there may be people who are squeamish about it. And I just want to preface it that there should be nothing squeamish about your own health, but even so, when you're talking about colon cancer, there are some people who just will not listen. And that's too bad because it could affect them and people that they love. Our guest today is Dr. Thomas Lewis from Brattleboro General Surgery. I'd like to thank you first uh, for coming thank in. Thank you for having me. Now, I understand that uh, this is Colon Cancer Awareness Month, and I, I, I want to just get the terms correct as we go. Uh, how prevalent is colon cancer in this country, in this region, and what is considered actual colon cancer? Well, uh, this is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, every March, we uh, use it as a forum to discuss colorectal cancer around the country, and I appreciate you having me on today. Colon and rectal cancer is uh, the second most common cancer uh, in the country. It uh, afflicts approximately 140,000 patients a year in the United States, and uh, a number of those patients live right here in Wyndham County and in Vermont itself. And I have to admit, this is a disease that has affected uh, at least a couple of members of my family. So I am more than a little curious, what is it and what is it caused by? Well, colon cancer uh, is uh, a disease of the large intestine, colon and rectal cancer. We lump them together. And it's caused by a series of genetic mutations that occur within the lining of the colon and rectum. Uh, that progress to an invasive cancer. So the lining of the colon and rectum is called the mucosa, and that lining is constantly turning over. Much as new hair cells are forming on us and, and skin cells, the lining of the colon and rectum is constantly turning over. And with that uh, reproduction of cells, at times some, some uh, alterations, some changes in the, uh, uh, in the process can occur. And if uh, through a series of genetic mutations, and uh, that those changes can lead to a cancer, which leads, which is in fact uh, cells invading through the mucosa, the lining of the of the colon, and uh, invading the the wall of the colon and rectum themselves, and going on uh, to uh, other organs possibly. Uh, this is different than colonic polyps. Colon polyps are usually a, uh, a, a precancerous sign. Those polyps didn't never take anyone's lives uh, unless they progress to a cancer, an actual invasive cancer, where they invade blood vessels and invade the organ itself. Colorectal cancer itself uh, is, uh, doesn't take any, any, uh, anyone's life unless it goes to a major organ, such as liver or lungs, typically. Uh, and uh, so we like to get to the, uh, we like to identify cancers at an early stage and uh, uh, treat them before they become. Uh, widely metastatic or before they to put the patient's life at risk. So if there's anything that we can say to people today, it's that you need to be checked. What is a proper screening? When should you do it? And what's involved? Well, really, well, this, is, this, is good, this, this message today is all about good news. The most appropriate screening test that we have is a colonoscopy, which is a surveillance of the entire colon and rectum with a lighted instrument done usually by a gastroenterologist or a surgeon, uh, and uh, it is done it, beginning at age 50 in this country as a usual screening examination. Uh, people are squeamish about it, people put it off, but really there, the misconceptions out there uh, far uh, uh, are, uh, should be cleared up. And the misconceptions are that it's a painful procedure, which it is not, uh, that it's a difficult procedure, which it is not, uh, and that it requires a lot of preparation, which it doesn't. So uh, really, in today's world, uh, a screening colonoscopy uh, has become a standard, and, it is, uh, and, and we have, we're able to see the benefits of it. If I, had, if I had this interview with you five years ago, I would not be able to sit here and actually say that colon, although I believed it, I would not be able to say with, with certainty that colonoscopies were, in fact, making a difference in our patients' lives and were diminishing the r rates of new colon cancer. But over the last several years, having done the colonoscopies on a screening uh, basis for probably two generations, 15 or 20 years of patients, 
we now see that the rates of new colorectal cancer in this country are dropping sharply. Just five years ago, the rates of new colon cancer were between 165 and 170,000 new cases a year. Now we're down to around 140,000 new cases a year. And I can assure you it's not because we as Americans are living a healthier lifestyle. It's probably and very likely due to the screening programs that have been put in place that have been uh, appropriately pushed by primary care physicians and that have been undertaken by gastroenterologists and surgeons. The, one of the questions you asked was how do we, how do we look for colorectal cancer and, I, and I've answered it by saying that the most appropriate test is a screening colonoscopy. There are other tests out there that, have, that, that, that can be done. The most simple test is a, is, is a fecal blood test where the examining uh, uh, hand of your doctor, the digital examination, can identify some uh, uh, stool in the rectum and can uh, ch check it for blood, or you can be sent home with a, uh, uh, with a, with a, uh, a device where you can check the blood, uh, get some stool, and bring it back to the physician's office, and he can check for blood. And that, that's great, but it doesn't always pick up on the precancerous polyps. That will, that'll pick up for blood in the stool, and really that's a late sign. That's, we're looking for something prior to that. Uh, you know, when I see patients for a screening colonoscopy, I'm very upfront with them, and I say to them, if you have no symptoms, if you have no blood in the stool, the likelihood of me finding a cancer is very close to zero. And so the patient says, well, why are we doing this then? And the answer is quite simply, that I'm looking for a precancerous lesion. I'm looking for a polyp in the, in the colon or rectum that in five or 10 years can uh, become a cancer. And this is where the colonoscopies are most useful because we can, uh, we can suggest to patients they have a colonoscopy and in about 30% of our patients, maybe 35%, a benign polyp, a non-cancerous polyp is identified that polyp can be removed with the colonoscope, looked at under the microscope, and it's in that segment of the population that I think we've made a difference and that that's why the number of new cases are going down. The other thing to consider is uh, that most colorectal cancers, you mentioned you had a family history yes. of colorectal cancer. That doesn't necessarily necessarily put you at, at, at a higher risk, uh, in most colorectal cancers are sporadic in nature. About 80% of them just occur through a series of mutations in the cells of the uh, lining of the colon rectum. When we talk about people having a family history or people having a genetic predisposition to colorectal cancer, that is a, about 20% of patients have a predisposition. And in those patients, the first of a series of mutations and usually it takes these five mutations in the, in the cell. The, the first of the mutations is inborn. They're born with it. So there's only four mutations that are needed to follow up. And, in, and that occurs in about 20% of patients. The overwhelming majority of, of patients with colorectal cancer uh, are, occur, occur in a sporadic fashion. They, they occur without any prior history and without any inborn uh, genetic mutation that could predispose them. And even in patients who have that inborn genetic mutation, not all of those patients go on to form colorectal cancer, even though we can identify that subset of patients. They are, those patients are at higher risk. Now, I should say that if you've had a member of your family uh, who's had a colorectal cancer, it's important, it is more important, for you, it, it is just as important, if not more important, for you to, to be screened uh, with a colonoscopy and if that cancer has occurred at a relatively young age, say before the age of 50, your screening should begin not at age 50 where the, where the population, uh, the general population is recommended. Your, pop, your, your screening should begin five years prior to the age of onset of your relative's cancer. Makes sense. Something I keep hearing all throughout uh, my life is that some of our diet and lifestyle choices may affect uh, whether you are more susceptible or not. What can you tell me about this, uh, especially where it concerns diet, um, things like either smoking or alcohol use, that sort of thing? Well, I think, uh, you know, in this country and in every country, uh, diet does affect health. Uh, 
but to sit here and say we have identified factors in our diet that uh, are, will predispose to certain types of cancer, particularly colorectal cancer, we suspect that a diet high in red meat, uh, a diet that uh, uh, low in uh, uh, fiber may cause, uh, may, may in fact uh, help predispose to colorectal cancer. The reason for that is that it leads to sluggish peristalsis in the colon. It leads to some of the toxins or the, or the chemicals in the food lying in contact with the lining of the colon longer than a diet that's higher in fiber and that uh, moves through the body more quickly. But truth be known, we, have, we really cannot say with certainty uh, that this is the case. We are really taking a step back and saying, well, in the United States or in westernized nations, we have an increased rate of colorectal cancer compared to nations that uh, have a, a different type of diet. And so we're, we're suggesting that our diet may have something to do with it. But I cannot sit here and say, don't go and have that that, uh, that steak tonight because you'll get a cancer if you do that. We, we would never say that and we can't say that. But diet affects, I think it's more important to look at, at overall diet uh, in, the, uh, in the general health of the population. And a diet high in fiber, a diet low in saturated fats, a diet uh, uh, that uh, uh, is based on uh, uh, more whole grains, uh, and a diet that, is, that probably has less alcohol in it, uh, certainly uh, a person who avoids smoking is, is undoubtedly going to put themselves in a position to live a healthier life. So while not necessarily our love affair with the quarter pounder would, uh, w would be an issue, certainly good overall diet guidelines, the things that we learned when we were growing up should be in order. That's true. And uh, a lot of what we're finding is a lot of uh, illnesses uh, are more prevalent in people who are overweight, people with uh, certain metabolic syndromes, people who have, uh, uh, you know, more body fat, um, will, they, will, they will be predisposed to uh, certain illnesses. And I think colorectal cancer is certainly in that, in that group. So why all the hubbub about fiber? Just what does that mean? Well, uh, the, the GI tract is really a, a, a straight tube from the esophagus, from the throat, all the way to the rectum. That tube works uh, uh, through muscular contraction, and food moves through from when you swallow it into your stomach, it moves through into the small intestine where digestion occurs, and then it moves on into the large intestine where water absorption and, uh, uh, it occurs, and the stool goes from a liquid form uh, into a solid form. A high fi fiber is not uh, digested as such by the body. It is moved through without being absorbed. And so it gets into the colon and it adds uh, substance to the stool, uh, to the liquid and then the solid stool so that the muscular contractions of the colon can move it through more quickly. And so a diet high in fiber allows uh, people to avoid constipation, allows more frequent uh, solid bowel movements and that all leads to good colonic health. Okay, so those fiber bars I've been eating are a good thing. Those are a good thing. Those are a good thing. <laughs> okay. The, the, other, the, other, the other thing about fiber is that uh, a diet high in fiber will lower your blood cholesterol by up to 20%. How come? Uh, it's the, uh, it, it helps with the, uh, with the absorption of the, uh, uh, of the cholesterol, how the cholesterol is absorbed in the small intestine. Uh, and, it, and we see that someone who for example, takes a, a fiber product over the counter, uh, if they're on an anti-cholesterol pill now, if they are uh, consistent in using a, uh, a fiber supplement, they may in fact not need that cholesterol pill or may need less of it, and they'll see better counts on their, on their cholesterol because of uh, uh, the way it interacts with the uh, absorption of cholesterol through the intestine. My goodness, uh, I want to tell you a story about a couple of family members. One who got checked regular and uh, did end up having cancer found through a screening. Another that was not checked at all and only found it after they had experienced some, uh, some bodily symptoms. Uh, the, the latter one did not live as long, but, uh, but, but certainly this can happen. Uh, what do you say to people who might be a little squeamish about, 
some of these testing procedures, et cetera? Well, uh, here's what I would say. The, I've already mentioned that the, the, the actual numbers of, of new colorectal cancer in this country is dropping dramatically, or at least dropping uh, uh, on a regular basis now because of our screening. So screening works. For, that's the first thing I would say. And uh, if one is, you know, there are a lot of patients that I've seen who are afraid to come in because they're going to get bad news. And, you know, of course, if they put the, something off long enough and they come in with certain symptoms, they're going to get the bad news. And then they look at me right in the eye and they say, I knew you were going to say that. I wish I hadn't come in. And I, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't belittle them. I don't chuckle at them. Uh, but I, I do want to say to, to patients in general that if you come in for a screening examination, the overwhelming amount, of, uh, majority of patients, 70%, have no findings and don't need another colonoscopy for 10 or more years. 30% of those patients will have, will have uh, a polyp that can be removed and may need a follow-up colonoscopy in three to five years, sometimes one year. But all of those patients have de decreased their risk of colorectal cancer. If it's the group of patients that wait until they have symptoms, a change in bowel habits, blood in the stool, uh, abdominal discomfort, to get their colonoscopy, that those patients are at the greatest risk. And, if, and it's those patients, really, I want to speak to today to say, it, you know, it's, it's those people who, who are of that mentality, of that ilk, who wish to put things off, that I really want to say, you need to come in sooner. You need to pay attention to your body. You, we're not, you know, we're, we're your friend. We're, we're your, provider, your health care providers. We're here to help you. And, uh, the, and the, the results uh, are, are borne out in, 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 how, uh, in the numbers that I've given you. In this day and age, one of the issues that obviously comes up is health insurance. Do health insurance plans, by and large, cover either all the screening or a lot of the screening minus a deductible? Yeah, that's a good question. A few years ago, I mean, five to ten years ago, many health insurance plans were reluctant to cover screening examinations, so patients had to come in with symptoms. I've just said coming in with symptoms is too late. We don't want that. We want you to come in without symptoms. We can do a better job. Health insurers were finally forced, would like to think they went willingly, but they didn't. They, they were, they, the health insurers finally came around and realized the benefit of screening colonoscopies. And the overwhelming majority of health insurance plans, if not all of them now, cover that. However, they, the hook that they now have is that they get patients to buy health insurance with a high deductible. And some of these deductibles are $1,000, $2,000, And that is, you know, that, and so patients are reluctant to come in because the only health insurance they could afford is the one with the high deductible. And that deductible, of course, will all be eaten up by the colonoscopy and by the hospitalization from the colonoscopy. Uh, so I think we need to continue to work, and I know in this state of Vermont we are working towards that with the governor working towards uh, change in our health insurance policy. Uh, but uh, there, is, there is still that, that uh, obstacle to overcome. Uh, we, we overcame the obstacle of not covering the screening examination, but the next obstacle is, is, that, that, is that they shouldn't have a high deductible for the screening examination. Hey, I was going to say, uh, one cancer treatment could certainly eat up what you'd be uh, saving by not offering screening. Well, this is, this is, this is the truth, isn't it? it uh, and, you know, that's from your, from your mouth to God's ears, or at least to the administrator's ears for the health insurance companies. But still, that is one of those policy questions that uh, uh, people need to discuss out in the community. And, and what you're able to do is, is help them when they come to you, and the earlier it, it's done possibly right. better. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Uh, f first of all, uh, the, the, we've talked that the screening colonoscopy does work. The other, th the other thing that people need to know during Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month is this. Colon and rectal cancer is, n is, is a highly curable cancer. We're, we've talked about ways to avoid the cancer using the screening colonoscope. We're talking about, uh, you know, getting the, the numbers of new cancers in this country down to very low levels. What if a patient is diagnosed with a colorectal cancer? Uh, what does that mean? And really, the take-home message here is that of the 140,000 patients a year that are diagnosed with colorectal cancer, 
The number of patients in this country who die from colorectal cancer each year is between 25 and 35,000. So now you can see that's a big discrepancy. The overwhelming majority of patients who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer are cured of the disease uh, through surgery and, with, and often a combination of surgery and chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So even if, if you are unfortunate enough to, to have the diagnosis, the likelihood of cure is extraordinarily high in this day and age. This is not something, again, to put your head in the sand and to say that, oh, you know, oh my goodness, this is the worst thing and, uh, you know, and, 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 and assume that this is going to take your life. No, the likelihood of it taking your life is still not great. How's quality of life a afterwards? I think the quality, I believe the quality of life it, from, for the majority of those patients is, is absolutely wonderful. Most patients, uh, for example, a patient with a, with a, uh, a standard cancer in the colon uh, would have a resection of that tumor uh, in, the, uh, in our operating room by myself or one of my partners or, or, one of the, or a general surgeon or a colorectal surgeon of their choice. They would have a resection. Um, we would remove a segment of the intestine, put the, other two, put the two segments back together and uh, the two ends back together, and they would stay in the hospital for three to five days and uh, go on, live a normal lifestyle, normal bowel movements, normal eating habits, and uh, go on to uh, uh, hopefully a normal life expectancy. If the cancer had spread beyond the colon and had gone to some lymph nodes, um, they would, we would refer them to the oncologist, and many of those patients would be candidates for adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, which would increase the cure rates significantly. Most patients who get operated on who don't need chemotherapy, the cure rate is, is very high in the, in the uh, 70 or 80 percent range. Patients who get operated on who have cancer that has spread beyond the, the bowel to the lymph nodes, um, the cure rate without chemotherapy for those patients is 50 percent long-term cure. The uh, long-term survival and cure rate is 50 percent. With the additional chemotherapy, that can be, that can be bumped up to, be, to over 60 percent. And uh, so these are, these are good numbers. These are, these, are, these, are, uh, these are great improvements, great strides we've made. Quality of life issues, when patients think of colorectal cancer, one of the things you're referring to perhaps uh, is a potential for a colostomy, where you have to wear an appliance because we bring out the end of the intestine onto the abdominal wall. That is, a, that is the overwhelming minority of patients that would need that. Most of those patients have a low-lying rectal cancer. Um, the last five percent of the GI tract, and so really uh, we're talking about probably only five or ten percent of all cancers that I would see would put patients in a category where that may be necessary. Sure, that's an alteration in lifestyle, but the trade-off is uh, a normal uh, a normal life expectancy and a return to essentially all normal activities and normal dietary activities and uh, return to your family. So yeah, there can be alterations in lifestyle, uh, but life expectancy should get back to normal. Uh, cure rates are high, and uh, you know, if, if patients are, are uh, fearful of lifestyle changes after colorectal cancer, there's no better, that, that's not a misplaced fear, but there's no better use that fear properly and get your, col your screening colonoscopy before you have symptoms and hopefully you'll never need to face your fears. So the bottom line here is get screened when it's appropriate. Work through your uh, uh, family physician. Yes, this is, this, uh, this, everybody should have a primary care physician and uh, all primary care physicians that I know of are, uh, 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 are, are up on this and are very aggressive about referring patients for screening colonoscopies. And again, that screening takes place to a gastroenterologist, we have a wonderful gastroenterologist in town here, or to one of the surgeons in town, and uh, you know we look forward to seeing the patients. And and uh, I would wouldn't mind if you shut down colorectal cancer if we cured it, and I could just uh, go go skiing and go canoeing, and I'll be done. Well, I I, I kind of like the sound of that. So, uh, uh, is there a number that uh, someone can uh, call for more information or a website they can check? Uh, you know, you can go to the, uh, the uh, uh, Brattleboro Memorial Hospital website, uh, and uh, you can order the Brattleboro General Surgery website, uh, and you can, or you can call the Physician Referral Service at Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, and 
uh, our personal number uh, is uh, listed there under Brattleboro General Surgery as well. And of course, the Brattleboro Memorial Hospital website is bmhvt.org. Dr. Thomas Lewis of Brattleboro General Surgery, thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. And again, our message is get checked. Don't let neglect rob your loved ones of more time with you or you more time with them. This is Tim Johnson. Thank you for watching.